I think both of the two remote students are having fall break this week, so we might not see them at all. But but still, nice to be back. Hope everybody had a good break. And we're gonna start the new chapter of Gibbs Sampler. So before we start, just a few announcements. I think some of you um, started asking questions about. The project, which is uh, definitely a good start. So a few announcements about that, and then we'll be able to start um, today's lecture. Okay, uh, so first of all, plan for this week. Uh, let's try to get through this chapter as much as we can. So you notice that uh, on Moodle, there are multiple files that are uploaded. So just so you know, for this chapter, Give Sampler, we have two sets of slides. One is this shorter one over here, just talk about the mechanics. We're gonna walk through with a normal, more normal model example. And then um, the other set of the slides is about the diagnostics. Okay, so it's two sets of slides we're gonna go through. I think finish the first one, start the second one. So that's what we're gonna do for today. On Wednesday, a couple of things. Uh, the homework four is due, so don't forget to bring it um, to class on Wednesday. Also, um, there are some team assignments that I asked before. So uh, go back, I will send a reminder email later today, but um, there are four different teams. So you're just gonna talk to each other through email. So a couple of things I would like you to report back as a team. One of them is um, go back to the previous chapter about the normal example, like a data analysis example in the slides. So um, that will be a team assignment. Uh, you're just gonna go through that uh, example and then we're going to talk about them and ask for some discussion. Uh, and also, um, I posted a um, accessible research paper, mm, about 10 pages, not really long, and it's called Explaining the Gibbs Sampler. Okay, it was a um, paper published back in 1992. I think it's uh, accessible and we used it last year uh, in the same class and I think students generally find it um, interesting and accessible and useful. So. We're gonna do that uh, this year again. So I, I posted another document um, as the reading guide for that particular paper. It contains about six questions. 
like you can like read those questions first and then um, um, read the paper and then in the end so on Wednesday we're gonna bring back um, each team to talk about discuss some of the questions from there as well as in the end those six questions will be part of the next homework for you to write a response so I think definitely um, read the uh, answer those questions first by yourself and then maybe come up with the team to, uh, to have a discussion later. So that's uh, for Wednesday. And so for both Wednesday and Monday, I think uh, this week we're gonna do some R demonstration, both of the sample R codes I posted. So we're gonna walk through them in class as well. And um, so next Monday, uh, I would just ask for like a paragraph long description about your project. It doesn't have to be very complicated, but I think you should all start thinking about the problem. So if you're gonna choose from the paper list that I posted, I would say you should give me a paragraph describing which paper you are trying to read, what is the timeline for you to read it, as well as if there's any like analysis or any code implementation that you want to do, just send me a paragraph describing all of those. I will send an email with all of the information as well, but, but just early on, like, we can bring this um, now, just talk about it. If you're gonna do a data analysis project, um, you should write up like a paragraph about the research question and what kind of Bayesian methods you're gonna use as well as what data set you're gonna use. So please start looking for all of these aspects. I mean, I think a lot of times looking for data set might be the hardest, so don't start super late. Oh, I have this fancy idea, I want to analyze an imaginary data set like this, and then in the end, if you couldn't find it, that would be a little bit unfortunate. So I would say um, do that as soon as you can. And if you want to try to come up with some new methodology, you can provide me a written list that you want to do as a paragraph submission for next Monday. Okay, so all of this, I will send an email, but um, just want to announce this um, early in the class. Okay. Questions? Project idea? Like, are, are you thinking about doing it individually or are you thinking about doing it with the team? You can do it most two persons in one team. And feel free to join the remote students as well. I think they feel isolated. So if any one of you would like to work with them, um, that would be nice. We have two students, I think. Uh, one of them is, doing a linguistics minor. So he's thinking about some kind of text mining techniques from the Bayesian methods to analyze some kind of um, method. Yeah, I think some kind of data set over there. Yeah, the other one is more about epidem epi epidemiology analysis. So um, yeah, so go back to Moodle, I think. At the end um, of the Moodle page, I posted people's interests over there. So maybe that will be a source for you to find partners if you want. And all right, so I will make an email and then talk about all of the points that I talked about. Okay, all right, so for today, we're gonna to talk about the Gibbs sampler. So there's a bug on my. Bye bye. <laughs> That's pretty large, too. The bug, right? Yeah, so let's just pretend that it's not. Oh, it's gone. Okay, sorry, it's coming to you, Alisa. Sorry. Anyway, uh, we'll be fine. We have a whole classroom of people. Anyway, uh, okay, sorry about that. Okay, so Gibbs sampler, um, it's one useful technique. Uh, it's one of the, so MCMC we talked about a little bit in the past, but not a whole lot. So maybe I'll give you some info. Sorry about that. Oh my God, <gasps> my crumbs. Okay. Um, so it's not there anymore. Okay. Yeah, let's deal with that later. <laughs> MCMC, okay. So the full name of MCMC is Mark of Chain Monte Carlo. Okay. So Monte Carlo is something that we talked about before. Okay. Anyone wants to give a quick summary of what we have done with Monte Carlo? And or what is your takeaway message from that chapter as well as all of the exercise or homework or exam question that we have done? What are um, the most interesting aspects or most useful aspects of a Mark Monte Carlo that is um, memorable for you at the moment? Anyone? Just Monte Carlo, just a quick review what you have what is the biggest takeaway message that you have regarding uh, Monte Carlo? Yes, Katie. When the, when the math is hard, 
like you can use it to sample from the the information that you like can easily get. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right, right, right. So we have seen cases where we mine. So there are cases that we know exactly what the distribution is, and then we verify using Monte Carlo approximation that you can get just as good as the analytic solution. And we have seen other cases, especially with the pre sorry, with especially with the predictive distributions. Sometimes the analytic solution is not available, then we're using Monte Carlo as approximation. So what's the general procedure of Monte Carlo approximation in any aspect, like in any application that you want to use the example, that would be fine. So if theta is the unknown parameter, then we sample different data values from the posterior, and then we take those data values and then sample new y's from the likelihood. Right, that's for the predictive, right? So you start with the posterior distribution of the parameter, and then, so you sample a lot of them, like capital S, that's the notation that we use, and then for each of those, if you're just doing predictive distribution, you're gonna, for each of those, generate new data. Okay, so a very key uh, component here, which I want to link to the new topic today from the Monte Carlo approximation is that for Monte Carlo approximation, we're doing a bunch of, sorry, okay. we're doing a bunch of, oh, I see. We're doing a bunch of independent draws. So all of the, R code that we have done before, like you use R beta, R norm, R gamma, all of those is you have a known distribution, say for theta, and you know the parameters of it, so you're gonna just draw independently multiple copies of them, right? So you do like, say, we use capital S, sometimes it's 5,000, sometimes it's 10,000, et cetera, et cetera, but most important thing, I think, aspect about Monte Carlo approximation is that you need to have independent draws to have a valid approximation. Okay, say so like if I generate 5,000 draws and then I take the mean of it, only if they're independent, you will be able to say that this is going to be a good approximation to the actual mean. Okay, so key idea over here, don't forget, because once we move to keep sampler starting from this chapter, once we move to the MCMC, Markov chain, Monte Carlo, it's gonna not be independent anymore, okay? But we still try to take, so all of the analysis that we can do with Monte Carlo, we need the independence, okay? But once we start doing Markov chain, Monte Carlo, they're not independent anymore, so we have a lot of stuff that we need to deal with how to, again, still get independent draws. Even if you're not draw, like even if you're not drawing them in an independent manner, how are you gonna do it? And so this will be a good um, thing to keep in mind at the beginning, because um, once yeah, once we get to that, you will notice that okay, the procedure that we're doing do not give us independent draws anymore. But how can we um, make sure that is still valid inference? So this will be um, a quick overview. So. What if, so another thing I guess will be interesting um, to highlight before we start is for the Monte Carlo approximation that we have done before, we're looking at conjugate priors, most of the cases, okay? So the examples that we did, beta binomial, gamma Poisson, Poisson, gamma, exponential and then for the normal case we have the normal normal this is the one parameter case mm -hmm. and then the normal gamma normal is the two parameter case okay so everything before the hyphen is about the prior Right? Everything behind the hyphen, it's about, after the hyphen, it's about the data, uh, like the data, data model. So here the normal, normal, if it's one parameter, we're doing only looking at the mean. And then if it's normal gamma, normal is for the mean, gamma is for the precision, and then it's the data model to be normal. Okay? So all of this, they're still under the good um, or easy, easy paradigm of conjugate priors. 
So what if you want to do a non-conjugate prior distribution? So once you're faced that kind of challenges, you notice that Monte Carlo approximation might not work because we don't even know how to derive it. And so here, think about, even if you want to, so remember like for the Monte Carlo approximation for posterior predictor, you still need the posterior first, right? You still need the anal analytical solution of the posterior. So for any of those, if it's not conjugate, there's no way you can do it. So um, this will be how Markov chain Monte Carlo sampling can be useful. Okay, so this is the general um, background of why we're doing this. And let's see how we can come up with a Markov chain Monte Carlo. So I'm using the example for a normal model. So again, you have mean and so here I start to use mu. It's just like, um, I mean, I think in the field people use mu and theta exchangeably. So previous lecture I used theta just to keep consistent with the textbook. But really, mu and theta, I mean, it's about the mean. So just also try to get used to uh, the notation with mu over here as well. So if I'm looking at a normal model saying that I think the data, each of the data, IID, following an IID distribution, normal center at mu, and precision is phi, uh, is phi so the variance is one over phi. So this will be uh, the general normal model that we had learned before. So now, I want you to think about a different prior specification. So what we did before, let me just do a quick review, the normal model that we did before. So for the one parameter normal normal, that's straightforward, okay? We are only making inference about the mean, and we, do, we assume that the variance is known. So anybody wants to give a quick, um, quick review of the two parameter model? What is exactly the gamma and uh, normal prior that we're doing? You don't have to, I mean, of course, you don't have to give uh, all of the hyperparameters, like all the zero, et cetera, et cetera, but just the general framework. How do we specify a normal gamma prior over there? What's the normal for? For the mean, right? What's gamma for? For the, yeah, gamma is for, for phi, right? The precision, right? So what we did before, it's a two level prior that you have, first of all, phi, follow a gamma, and then mu given phi, okay? So this is the key difference now. Back then, in order to have the nice results from conjugacy, we have this two level prior. Phi is a gamma which is about the precision, and then mu given phi is a normal. So this phi, the precision, actually plays a part in the normal prior for the mean, okay? So this is what we learned before. And um, back then, we can use Monte Carlo approximation because everything is conjugate, okay? So let's see what we're doing now. Now we assume that mu is independent of phi. Okay, say so I don't believe that the mean should be related to the variance or the precision at all. I want to do two independent priors. So say, these are the two that you set up. So I assume that mu is a normal at mu zero and then one over omega zero. That would just be the new um, variance, like omega zero over there. And then phi is the independent gamma itself. So here, the gamma is, the, is in the same notation as before, okay? So the big difference is, phi is the same, it doesn't change. But here, from before, the mu is independent from phi now, okay? So I just want to highlight again. Back then, in last chapter, when we do the normal models, when we're looking at the two-parameter model case, we're doing this marginal of phi and then conditional mu given phi in this setup, because it's conjugate, we will be able to derive the results. Okay? So I, I guess, I, I think I actually remember, like Katie, you asked the question last time, like, oh, why do we set up in this way? Why can we do like margin of mu and then phi given mu, right? Or maybe you already thought about the new like situation that we're trying to work with. How can we just put them separately? We don't want to put any kind of dependence in that way. 
So all of those questions are legitimate. Back then, we didn't do them because only this one gives us conjugacy. Okay, and that would be a good way to introduce the normal model for the first place. But now you can relax that requirement. I want to do independent um, priors. What can we do? So a few things. Uh, first of all, in the textbook, I think they use theta for mu. So that would be the first difference. So just pay attention. When you read the textbook, it's going to be a different notation uh, with uh, what I have in the slides. Another thing is, I think the textbook still keeps using a variance for all of the derivation, but because um, I think using the precision makes more sense, gives more intuition. So in the slides, we're using the precision for this case. Okay. So for the theta, uh, so, sorry, for phi, it's no change. It's gamma nu 0 over 2, ss 0 over 2, just like before. And then here, mu center at mu 0, and its variance is 1 over omega 0. In the textbook, they used tau zero square to be the variance. Here, we're using the precision. Okay. All right. So, like you, you might guess. Okay. Here, this is my belief. I want to set it up. So, what would be the problem here? So, the problem I would say is if you try to derive what the posterior for each mu and phi, you will figure that you will see that you won't be able to recognize what it is. So, that would be the challenge. Okay. So, let's see. Maybe the first one over here. So this one is still nothing new. This is trying to write the joint posterior in this way. And the joint posterior will be a bunch of products, like bunch of terms product together, right? Uh, so the joint posterior, this will be the data, data model. And this is from the prior, okay? So in order to get the joint of the posterior, we know that it's going to be proportional to data times the prior. Okay, so this is what we have seen before. And I further did some other work for you. This is um, in, this, right, in the current setup, the independent prior case, this will be what you're going to have. Okay, so... so once we get to this point, I mean, not only in this um, particular setup, but even in previous um, section, previous chapter, if you're looking at the joint over here, naturally, if you have two parameters, naturally, you might have two ways to factorize it, right? Either you have the marginal phi and then the conditional mu given phi. Everything is conditional on y because that's posterior, okay? So either you have the marginal phi and then mu given phi, so this is way one. Or, oh, if I can find the margin of mu and then conditional phi given mu, both of this is going to give me the joint, right? So now we're faced with the task that, okay, I know what the joint is. How am I supposed to sample from this joint? We know that this is the entire joint. Whether one of this way is going to give me a feasible way to sample the joint. Okay, so this is the task. Okay, so in the past, in previous chapter, we kind of did it, right? But like, we never really phrased it in the way that, oh, you have the joint, you might have two ways to do it. Because back then, in the prior, so this is uh, last chapter, the prior was already set up in conditional, mu given phi and then phi. So naturally, the posterior, we, and we know that we were told that it's going to be uh, conjugate, so naturally we just try to derive that. Okay? So given any new situation, this will be a good start. We have two ways. If it's two parameters, you have two ways to factorize it. Which one is going to give me a better result? Better result meaning that I will be able to use computer to sample it. Okay? So this is um, the question at hand. And I would like you to maybe try both ways. If you actually, okay, so this is the previous, um, okay, this is um, like the joint over here. So maybe after class, if you try to derive it, you'll realize, okay, if I try to have this, this is what I can recognize if I'm doing mu given phi and y. However, if you try to do this, 
you are not able to recognize what it is. Okay, so this is the first factorization. Factorization of, sorry, mu. Mu phi given y, I want to factorize it into mu given phi y, and then phi given y. Okay. So the first factorization will be, okay, it will be more straightforward if you try to find out the conditional mu given phi and y first, and that's what we did before from last chapter as well. So if you do that, you'll realize, okay, this will be the normal, but if I'm faced with the leftover terms for phi, I won't be able to recognize what it is. Okay. So, I mean, I don't want to go through all of this in class because that's um, like tedious um, derivation over there, but um, if you're interested, you're definitely encouraged to do it later. But for this particular setup, I just want you to know that if you go with the first factorization, it doesn't work. Because even though you can find the conditional mu given phi and y, which is you get this good, but you don't get this one. And then we won't be able to sample it, right? So this is the first factorization. Unfortunately, it doesn't work out. The second factorization, we know that it's going to be trying to get phi mu given y equals to phi given mu and y, and then times mu given y. Okay. So if you do this one, you realize, OK, I'm going to try to recognize mu given phi and y first. So if you do the usual algebra work that we did, you will realize that you'll be able to recognize it to be a gamma. But unfortunately, the marginal of mu given y is impossible. Okay. So I know, I mean, it's a lot of um, new material to start with, but um, the general take, take away for this few um, slides is we have the joint. We need to figure out how to sample them. So in order to get the joint, we can either get one way of factorization or another. Both of the factorization is trying to get the joint from the product of a marginal and the conditional. Okay? So if you do both of this, you'll realize that even though for the conditional one, we can always find it. I mean, you can always make it work because you'll be able to recognize it's either a normal or a gamma. But if you're left with the rest, the rest cannot work because you cannot recognize what the distribution is. So this is the biggest takeaway. And the problem, I mean, I wouldn't say a problem. Uh, the most, the reason I think uh, for this is to happen is that we're doing this independent prior, okay? So in last chapter, it worked because it's a conditional mu given phi and then marginal phi, and then it turns out to be um, uh, conjugate. But once you're relaxing that requirement, once I want to do something not as complicated as that kind of conditional, if I want to do this independent priors, it turns out to be actually more complicated because now I won't be able to recognize what it is. So this actually will be the most cases that we're going to face with. So in the past, it's nice results from the conjugacy. You can always get some posterior from the way that you set it up. But in reality, or if you want to do, if you really want to put on the priors that you believe in, then you might not fall into like the situation might not fall into one of the good cases that you don't have to worry about the sampling because it's given there for you because it's not conjugate anymore. So this is more useful and I think more uh, realistic. So the general approach people do this posterior sampling is to do it in a recursive way. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the mechanics first and then we're going to see um, how things work uh, using our demonstration. So what do we have? Remember, we have the joint mu and phi given y. We know it's a complicated form, okay? We try two ways of factorizations, neither of them work. But what we find before, super useful, is, let me write it over here. Even though not everything worked, but for both of the factorization, 
we find mu given phi and y. We know it's a normal, right? We couldn't find phi given y, but that's fine. At least we know if we're gonna sample, try to sample mu given phi and y, we know that it's a normal, we can recognize it. The second factorization, if you factorize it into this way, we know that it's gonna be a gamma, okay? Unfortunately, uh, mu given y in that factorization, we couldn't recognize it, but at least we can recognize the gamma in the first place. So that's what we did um, before so far. So this actually pushed people to think, oh, even though I couldn't get the joint properly through the factorization that we know like from the probability theory, but we somehow can get each parameter given everything else. Okay, so this is the key idea. In all of this deep sampling and then the MCMC other techniques later we're gonna see, the key idea is that, okay, I want to know the joint, I don't know how to do, but I figured, oh, I can recognize every, so here in this particular model, you have two parameters, mu and phi, right? You figure out that mu given phi and y is a normal. You also figure out phi given mu and y is a gamma, okay? However, if you try to do the proper probability theory, you cannot multiply these two together, right? If you multiply by these two, it doesn't give you the joint, right? These two. However, theory guarantees that, which we're gonna see soon, that we don't, of course, we don't multiply them together, but we can still sample parameters from each of these two terms. And then if you sample it large enough times and do something about it, you will be able to get the joint in some way. Okay, so this is the key idea. Okay, so let me just restate it again. You have a joint mu and phi given y, that's the posterior, that's your goal. In most of the cases, nothing work out as the conjugate, okay? So this demonstration, we're looking at the um, normal case, like independent priors for mu and phi, we realize that you cannot do factorization. However, from both of the factorization, what we realize is that we can find mu given phi and y to be a normal. We can also find phi given mu and y to be a gamma. Okay, so these are the two conditional distributions that even though we cannot product them together because taking the product of these two cannot give you the proper joint, but we are able to sample mu and phi from here, right? Because we know what the distribution is. We can sample a bunch of them. Unfortunately, they are not Monte Carlos anymore, but in the end, we'll be able to do something which we call thinning about it to make sure they're independent. Okay, so let me tell you. So this is the general uh, motivation, and let me show you how the procedure actually works. So now we have mu given phi and y to be normal, phi given mu and y to be gamma. So the way to do it is actually, okay, I'm gonna sample a mu given phi and y. And then I say, I call it mu1. I use this upper script just to, in, like, to denote the index in a way that I'm telling, okay, this is the first mu that I draw. And I draw this from, oh, let me, so I draw this from this distribution, which is the normal. Okay? Yeah, so this is first step. I draw a new mu. I use the upper script one over there to indicate that this is the first one. So if you have a value of mu now, from the second factorization, we know that phi given mu and y is a gamma. So naturally, you will be able to draw your new value, the first value of phi, right? From phi given mu and y, which is a gamma, right? So after you do these two steps, you get a joint, like two draws, each one draw for mu, one draw for phi. And it's, you can think of them as a combo. You get them after two steps, okay? All right, so if you do this, what will be the natural next step for you to do? We want a lot of draws for each of them, right? And we know that the relationship between mu and phi is convoluted in a way that it's not marginal, 
is conditional on everything else. Okay. Here I'm saying everything else. I mean, you only have one parameter in the data, but think about later if you have multi-parameter models, this will still be the way to do it. If I have P different parameters, sorry, multi-parameter models, yes. So if you have multi-parameter models, say P different parameters, I can do this for all of them and do it iteratively. And then if I do it long enough, I will have enough draws for each of the marginal. Okay. So the next step, I would say, will be now I have a draw of phi1. I'm going to draw a new mu, which I call it mu2. And it's from phi1 and y. Okay, so this is from the data. This is from the previous draw of phi. And that, because we know that mu given phi and y is a normal, so I'm gonna draw from that normal. And that will be my second draw for my mu. And then I'm gonna draw my second draw of phi, and I keep doing that. Yes? So the first draw that you do of this mu, just because you're prior for Right, good question. So, right, the first draw you just don't know because you say, like, you, you know that C, like, you might want to plug in C for some, for some value, et cetera. So there are multiple ways of doing this. So I would say the key idea, actually, later you're going to see that if it's going to be a good model or if it's going to be a good sampling, no matter where you start, you're going to arrive at the same place. Okay, so that's actually uh, Eli's question is great because you can start at any point, but if it's going to be approaching, or approximating the true posterior distribution, it doesn't matter where you start, right? So that's actually a good practice. Later, you're gonna see that. Usually, we're gonna run multiple chains. We call those chains, because it's iteratively. You have one given the other, and then vice versa, vice versa. You're gonna run multiple chains. Maybe you want to start at different values. Maybe you want to do something else. But in the end, if it's approaching, approximating the true density, you'll be able to get the same results, yeah. So, to answer your question, you can just plug in, you can just plug in from the data, you can just plug in any kind of stuff that you think of. But in, like, in practice, yeah, in theory, it wouldn't matter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, so good question. How are you gonna start? You need to start with the value. And then once you have mu1, you'll be able to um, do theta1 and fe1 and et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so mechanics, I think, works pretty uh, straightforward. Right, once, so pretty much you have the joint. I'm gonna try to derive the margin, uh, like the conditional. Here, the conditional is not some random conditional I can think of. It's one parameter conditioning on everything else. So that's the key idea, okay? So for this case, mu given phi and y is a normal. Phi given mu and y is a gamma. So those will be the conditional I'm gonna try to sample from. So this is the mechanics. And um, say this is just a similar uh, slide. You can also start some mu zero, phi zero with some random values, and then you can start doing that. So there are multiple ways. Some people like to initialize zero values, like the first draws for both of them, and then you start the iterative like procedure. Or you can do mu zero and then uh, and then immediately like phi one. Yeah. So whichever you prefer, that's fine. In theory, you wouldn't mind if it's going to convert to the true density. So key idea, key point over here. Because now, so what is it? Mu 1, and then it's affecting theta 1, right? And theta 1 is affecting mu 2. And, and then mu 2 is affecting theta 2. And this goes on, go on, until you finish your sampling. So we cannot regard them. So even though like between mu1 and mu2, there is a phi1, but you cannot simply regard this to be independent anymore, right? So after all of the procedure, what you get is you're getting a bunch of independent samples of mu and phi, okay? All of the mu's, like mu1, mu2, and then mu3, all of the ones later, they're independent in some way. Uh, they're dependent in some way because of the way that we sample them. And all of the fees are gonna be dependent as well. So this is telling us if you just have all of the draws together, if you just take the mean, because there are dependent draws anymore, 
it's not going to be a good approximation to the truth because they're dependent. Okay? So what we learn from Monte Carlo, so this is at the beginning of this lecture, what we learn from Monte Carlo is that you need independent draws to guarantee that your approximation is good. Okay? However, in this setup, unfortunately, we won't be able to get independent draws, but at least we get a bunch of draws. Okay? So the next natural step you might be wondering is how we can make those independent draws, sorry, make those dependent draws to be independent, and then we can summarize this as what we did before. Okay? So this is the biggest difference, and I think um, we're gonna see like actual ways to do this, and then you realize, um, yeah, you will know how we can do it. So the Gibbs sampler, so what I described earlier, just Gibbs sampler. Gibbs sampler meaning that if I have multiple parameters, in this case mu and phi, I can find two margin or two conditional, mu given phi and y, and then phi given mu and y, I can recognize this to be a normal, I can recognize this to be a gamma, and then I sample them iteratively, and then this, the whole procedure is keep sampler. Okay, so a natural next step, which is gonna be next chapter, will be what if I cannot recognize this? Okay, so in this chapter, we're gonna talk about the situations where we can recognize them so we can just sample. But in situations where you cannot sample it, you're gonna use something called metropolis tasting algorithm over there, which will be a chapter uh, for our course as well. But for now, we're dealing with the cases you're gonna know what they are and then you can do it directly. Okay, so I was talking about this earlier already. All of the fees are, in de are dependent anymore, uh, are dependent now, and all of the mu's are dependent. So you will be able to um, say like, say like you can extend it to more than two parameters and then we'll be able to do something in order to make it independent now so we can do summarize just like what we did before. All right, so I think the mechanics is not crazy. And uh, now this is just a slide of summarizing. Okay, what if you have multiple parameters? For multiple parameters, so here I'm using theta as a generic um, representation, and I have m different um, parameters. So the Gibbs sampler is going to work in this way. I'm going to sample theta one first from its conditional distribution, theta one, given everything else. Okay, so you notice that I start to use this word everything else. We're just going to use it as a way um, to express. Is conditioning all of the other parameters as well as the data. Okay, and we have a term for all of these distributions. We call them full conditional. Okay, full conditional meaning uh, I'm conditioning on all of or everything else, pretty much. Like it's full conditioned on everything else. So theta one from here, and then theta two immediately. I will be able to because I can recognize what it is, but keep in mind that you're going to plug in the newly drawn theta one from the previous step. Okay. And then theta three, the same, but now I have theta two and theta one newly drawn. Okay. And you do it until the last parameter, which is theta m. And then that's all of the previous draws that I have for all of the other parameters. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right, so okay, so let's just work on this like more than two parameter case. So Katie's question is what are the final uh, products that we have? So let's take a pause and think about what we're doing. So when you have more than two parameters, we have this joint that we want to make samples from, right? So this will be the goal. So Gibbs sampler is a case that even though we don't know how to sample from the joint, we know the form. It's a complicated term, a lot of things product together. The goal is to have draws from the joint, but we don't know how to draw from them. 
But for deep sampler, if you'll be able to recognize all of the full conditional distribution, meaning that every parameter given everything else, including the data, if I can recognize the distribution of that, that will be a way to do deep sampler because I will be able to generate a lot of samples from each of these distributions. Okay, so think about what we're gonna do. If you have m different parameters, if I'm doing it, let's say, s equals to 5,000 times, what I'm gonna get in the end, I have m different parameters. Each, so this is the entire iteration, right? From each of the iteration, I'm getting m draws, one draw for each of them, right? So this is one iteration, but I'm doing it for say 5,000 times. So after I'm done, I'm gonna have, for each of the parameters, say theta one, I'm gonna have 5,000 5, draws. For theta two, I'm gonna have 5,000 draws, right? For theta m, I'm gonna have 5,000 uh, 5, draws. Yeah, so I mean, in practice, when you're doing an R, for example, it's gonna be actual draws from the distribution. So this, the general idea of this Gibbs sampler as well as MCMC is, the goal is to get the joint. I don't know how to get it, but I can recognize for Gibbs sampler, I can recognize all of the full conditional. After applying some extra steps, I will be able to get all of those draws together, be a good joint, like be a good approximation to the joint distribution. And each of the parameter itself, if I'm only looking at the 5,000 draws for theta one, for example, after some manipulation, it's gonna be a good approximation to the marginal. So that's the theory behind, which we wouldn't go into detail, but the general idea, so maybe let me just write it. So we start with, okay, what we have. With theta one, theta two, until theta m. So m parameters. Okay. So Gibbs sampler works in this way. First of all, we get full conditionals. And notice that you have m different parameters. You need to get m different full conditionals. And you need to recognize all of them before you can do deep samplers. Okay, so for the two parameter normal case that we just start, we started with this chapter. It's um, a simpler case that you only have two parameters and one of them is normal, one of them is gap. Yeah. Okay, but for generalized to M parameters, this is what you're gonna do. So full conditional M of them. Okay, so this is the first step. Second step is you're gonna draw samples. Samples are drawn sequentially, theta one, given, so another notation that we can, uh, we can use just, just to be simpler, just gonna write a longer hyphen over here to mean that it's everything else, okay? So I'm gonna sample theta one from here, theta two from this, theta three from this, until theta m from this, for each iteration. Okay, so I can write T, 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 to represent uh, that particular iteration. And then do it like step two for S iterations. Okay, so once you have done, so just, just to answer just, just to answer um, Katie's question one more time. Once you have done this, what you have? I have theta one as draws. Theta two, I also have as draws. Theta m, I have as draws as well. Right, yeah. So we're gonna have um, theory guaranteed us to make inference in this way that we have as draws for everything from the Gibbs sampler, two things that we will be able to do. First, each of the theta i, the as draws, after some manipulation, it's gonna be good approximation 
to the marginal theta i. Okay, so I'm going to write marginal. Okay. When I say marginal over here, it's not conditioning on anything else. Okay. It's just the distribution itself about theta. So for each of the theta i, i from 1 to m, that's what we can do. And second, for the combo of theta 1, theta 2, until theta n. So if you think of this as a combo, it's going to be s combos together, right? So the whole thing together after some approx uh, manipulation is going to be a good approximation to the joint of the, the dis uh, I mean, the joint of the posterior. Make sense? Yeah. So once you have done this whole procedure, you are allowed to do multiple things. Most importantly, I think people care about the first ones because they care about each of the parameters more. Yeah. But at the same time, don't forget that all of the combos together. I mean, we won't use all of them because remember the problem with all of this, they're dependent. We need to figure out a way to get rid of the dependence, to make them independent. So once we do that, you'll be able to summarize just in the way that I talked about. Um, one thing I'm not quite understanding mm -hmm. is how you end up with S uh, iterations in each parameter because you're sort of, as far as I understood, you're reusing the old parameters in some of your joint draws. Like in, in, in the normal case, your first order pair is U1 um, sigma squared one. Mm -hmm. But then your second order mu2 sigma right good point okay so let me bring back the slides over there yeah so okay so again there are so many different ways people are trying to label the index so like say in the slides say right now on this particular ooh, sorry in this ah uh, yes okay in this particular slice the way to do it is you start with initials for both okay and then for any of the t, you're going to get a joint like this. Okay? So to get mu t, you're going to use phi t minus 1 from before. And then for the new phi at the t iteration, you're going to use the one that you just drawn. So then when you do all of this, it's going to give you a combo of mu t and phi t. Yeah. But I think your reasoning, which is fine as well, Oh, I don't want to put mu t and phi t as a combo. I want to put mu t and phi t minus 1. That's totally fine. But you're still doing it, right? I mean, the next step you're getting, so this is the, like at this particular iteration. And the next one you're going to do is going to be mu t plus 1 and then phi t, right? But that would just be fine as well. Um, how does that translate to multiple all right, so if you're going to have multiple of them, let me bring back the slides over here to see if I... Yeah, so for multiple parameters, I think you're just doing it the same thing. So this iteration, I mean, in the slides, the way that I wrote it up, will be for the t minus 1 iteration, uh, t plus 1 iteration, right? So I'm going to get theta 1 for that, and this is using all of the previous draws for all of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I'm updating one by one, one by one, until I do M of them, so I'm going to get a new set of things. Okay, and then that's, that's your new mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Sure, so, yeah. So you're doing, so you do that process two times, you get a PC and a UT and a CT. And so then is that just one of your S's and you do the process again? No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. Good question. Right. So let's see. Okay. So this one, right. So in this particular setup, you start with some initial values. Okay. And for, so here, T from one to capital T. So this T will be the S that I was talking about, but depends on the notation that you use. Yeah. yeah. So for a particular time point T or iteration T, I'm going to get mu T from phi T minus one. 
And then from that phi t minus one, oh sorry, from the new draw and mu t, I'll be able to get phi t. And this will be the combo at time t plus one. Uh, yeah, time t, yeah. Right, right. So yeah, so I would say, okay, so if I, I guess another way to represent it will be, okay, what if I'm doing, so these are all of the mu's, and these are all of the phi's, okay? I'm gonna get a zero, zero to start with. So uh, this is bad notation. A bad table. Let me do it. Mu and phi, and then this will be t. Okay, so t zero, one, two, three, until like t, and then, yeah, and then capital T, right? So we start. So you start. So say you're given. You start with initial values, right? So then this gonna tell me this one, right? The mu, okay, phi zero gonna give me mu one, and then mu one gonna give me phi one. And then this phi two, a uh, phi one gonna give me mu two. And then, yeah, so if you try to, I guess this will be another way to represent how things work. Okay, but after all of this, you realize I have combos at this time, right? I have here, I have here, I have here. So I'm gonna end up with T, capital T numbers of pairs. So what I was saying that all of those, after getting rid of the in a dependency, we'll be able to know that this is gonna be a good approximation to the joint, okay? And each of them gonna be after manipulation of the dependency will be good approximation to the marginal. Yeah, so this is the key, I think, um, key backup theory of how deep sampling is gonna work, okay? But in practice, you see that, yeah, so I mean, yeah, I think right now we should just bring to uh, bring up the code that I shared, and you will see how things work. Um, but I think it's good discussion here because um, not everything will be um, say like, oh, two parameter may be easy, but like I'm doing multiple parameters, but you will see that it's actually just work the same. And then uh, the procedure itself is producing you um, capital T. Let's use capital T here. Capital T um, numbers of combos of the joint. And then each of the combo gonna have like one one draw from one parameter. So if you only like get those line out and just look at one parameter, that's gonna be a good approximation to the marginal. Okay, all right. So if you brought your laptop, it would be nice to bring it out now because uh, the code that I shared is exactly doing um, the thing um, that I was talking about. So let me. We need to log in over here and then we'll be good. Yeah, so it's, um, so if you go to Moodle, you will see a, there are two R code over there, but um, it's the first one about normal model, give sample a normal model. I will bring this up over here as well. Give me a second. Yeah, so it's the... Okay. So if you bring up the code, give me a second. Okay, so this will be um, the normal model using the Gibbs sampler to answer uh, the question like the data from before, the normal um, data with the IQ scores. Okay, so on the top, you will see that, I mean, the first part of this, so this is the data, 
So I return, like give you the data as well as uh, give you all of the, like the, uh, the number of data points as well as the mean and SS from the data. So don't worry about everything from here. This is just like a flashback to what we did before once you're doing in the conjugate prior case. So this is from chapter five. You can maybe do this later after class, but scroll down to around like line 28. That's where we're doing a semi-conjugate prior that we're doing right now. Okay, with the independent priors in chapter six where you're having phi and mu separately independently. Okay, so take a moment to read through and try the sample code over here. You'll see that, okay, a Gibbs sampler is really like very straightforward, just in a for loop and they're doing things iteratively. Okay, but hopefully like going through the code can give you some idea and then answer some of your concerns about how the Gibbs samples work. You're encouraged to stick together just to work on this together. It's a sample code, so you'll see that it's going to run and it's going to work. Um, so you can try that. But most importantly, ask any kind of questions that you have regarding um, the technical, the mechanical steps over here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so here uh, you notice that I start like save records over there and then I like C to B. So REP is repeat, right? So NA is just like not recorded, like zero or like empty. It's mostly like empty. So I'm trying to initialize the empty vector. Okay. Yeah, over here. So I try not to use zero or any particular values because maybe it's going to be actually that value saved. So I'm trying to do NA. So to make sure that it's, but I guess using zero would just be fine as well. Anything will be fine. Right. And I, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Good question. So Rachel's question is what this NA for? So this can be a, a standard practice uh, for you to do a deep sampler. This is uh, initializing an empty vector length of IE, ITR, which is uh, a, a thousand. And then uh, each of the, element is going to be NA, which is like not available or whatever. But once you run the Gibbs sampler, the new draw is going to overwrite that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you notice that like initial values, I said, doesn't matter. So if it's going to be a good sampler, it won't matter where you start. run this and then bring up the plots over here too. So you realize the Gibbs sample works like run pretty fast in this particular demonstration. I mean sample is really small iterations is um, not many of them it's only a thousand drops and for me I think when I run this time I saw so this will be the ten uh, a thousand draw summary of the mu and then the other one will be a thousand draw summary of the fee okay. 
you might not get exactly the same number, but the rough, I think the shape and stuff will be the same. Sorry? Uh, it's from the full conditional. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So both of this. So if you start looking at line 46 and 47, that's um, the two full conditionals that we got from the slides. If you, yeah, you definitely should go back to verify that everything is done in the way that you thought it should, it should be. Don't just like rerun the code really quick. Let's talk about how to understand these two graphs. Okay. So first of all, both of the graphs are giving you 10,000 draw summary of each of the parameters. Okay? So here, so here, this is the one that I got. And you notice that, like, it's, it's kind of, I mean, depends on, like, depends on how you're looking at the range. I think earlier when Katie reported that, I think um, you might, if you have a zoom, like zooming at this particular area, you might think, oh, it's too much bounce back and forth. I'm not sure if it's going to be converging, right? Because ideally, we would like to see a converge some values or like showing a distribution. So for both of the plots, that's what, that will be the first thing that you should try to try to um, identify. And we're going to talk about like whether we can evaluate this is going to be a good approximation or not very soon. But I just want to um, bring bring your attention to the particular plots that we're doing right now. So each of this is ten thousand draws for one parameter, okay? And it's iterative draws, and they're dependent because say you know, like phi one, no phi. Uh, mu one is affecting mu two, it's affecting mu three, et cetera, et cetera. So they're all dependent in some way. So if you want to do some kind of multi color approximation, this is not yet good because we need to get rid of the dependence in some way. Okay, so this will be a good um, lecture of material, which is the second set of the slides that I posted. We call it diagnostics. Okay, so now we have round chains, and you can see that. Running a deep sampler chain is actually pretty straightforward. I have the data, I initialize my initial values for two parameters, and then because of the two full conditionals that I can draw, like I can derive, I can just put them over there, and this will be the way that I'm doing it. Okay. So some subtle things over here I think will be um, good to highlight. So first of all, I mean, this is just a like coding preference, but I put, say, like mu and phi over there, just like a very generic name. Because I'm really trying to, because think about in the iterative, like the Gibbs sampler, in each of the iteration, you have to use the previous draw and value in the new draw, right? So that's why, like, I chose just to be like mu and phi. I don't have any, like, time index or, or iteration index at all over there. But I save it later to make sure that I save in the right iteration. Okay? But you should develop your own preference. This is, like, again... The sample code that I provide in R, like the R sample code that I provide on, um, on Moodle will look different from the sample code the text would provide, but you can like learn from both and then try to come up with the ones that you prefer. Okay. Anything else about um, the particular R code? So this one runs really fast. And I think usually like a thousand probably is not enough. Especially later, you will see that in order to get rid of the dependence, we're gonna not save every draw, but we're gonna save every other 10 draws, or every other 50 draws, because maybe you will see some dependence among the adjacent draws. But once, so the process that I described earlier is just, we call it thinning. It's a long, heavy, dense chain, but we thin it by every 10 draws or every 50 draws, et cetera, et cetera. So we call the name, like we call the procedure thinning, but the procedure is trying to get, get rid of the dependence among the draws. So later you will see that usually a thousand draw is too small. We're gonna do many, many more than that because you're gonna do the thinning procedure in order to get enough independent draws that you want, okay? So for example, 
if I'm going to run it a, a 10,000 iterations and um, I'm going to save every other 10 draws. So that's going to be giving me only a uh, thousand draws in total, independent draws, ideally to summarize, right? So usually you're going to do many more. And another thing, which, yeah, maybe we only have five minutes. So I don't think I'll be able to bring up the other slides. But another thing, maybe just based on the plots that we have seen so far, you will see that for the diagnostics later we're going to do, Another important thing is, so earlier, Eli's question earlier was, how am I supposed to know where I'm going to start, right? So I was answering the way that even if you start at many different points, you should come to a particular range of values that is like the sample space that we want to explore, okay? So if you start multiple chains, sometimes say like for the mean, for example, this is the mean example, say, oh, I don't want to start with 10. So from the plot, we see that it's going to stabilize around 10, right? So we might guess that, okay, 10 might be a good starting point, but you don't know anything better at the beginning. And we should never like oh, run it and think about it. Oh, what I should I have done earlier, like differently. But the point is, oh, even though later I know it's going to start, like it's going to stabilize around 10, I might want to start at 100. I don't care. It's probably, if it's going to be like really exploring the sample space well enough, it's going to go to 10. Right? It doesn't matter where I start. So this brings another point of what diagnostics, one kind of diagnostics that we do is we're going to throw away, say, um, I think by tradition, throw away the 50% of the draws that we have because we don't want the initial values to affect our analysis in the end. Okay? So that process is called burning, like you're burning, burning. So um, usually it's 50%. So that gives another idea of, oh, maybe sometimes sampling 10,000 draws are not enough either because we have to throw away the first 50% and then do the thinning, okay? So that's why uh, for complicated models, you will see that the Gibbs sampler is going to run super slow and then you still need a lot of draws. So that's usually what people criticize about Bayesian methods because you need very strong computation resources. Okay, so just so you know, but, um, but for now, I think uh, this will be some other aspects of the diagnostics that we want to do. Okay, anything else? Any other comments on the plots or like on any of the uh, procedures that we have done? Yeah, Eli? Why not plot the density like you did with the... Mm, you can, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can plot the density. So here, good question. So for diagnostics, you notice that we like to plot something like this. And later in next, uh, in next uh, lecture, we're going to... Um, use some, um, let's see, some package to do like things like this. So this particular plot, we actually call it a trace plot, tracing the iteration. Okay, so yeah, so a way to read those trace plot, we don't plot density yet because we want to evaluate how good the convergence is. Yeah, but say once I say, let's say I draw, I have done five, uh, 10,000 iterations, so I threw away the first 50%, so I 5,000 left, then I save every other 10 just to get rid of the dependence. So I get 500 draws in the end. And at that time, you should do density, right? Because now I want to summarize about this parameter. So I think at that point, it definitely makes more sense to do histogram, to summarize the mean, to do the variance, whatever, all of the things that you want to do. But at the diagnostic um, stage, um, it makes more sense to look at plots like this. Yeah, good question. So you will see that. Uh, in next chapter, in next lecture, we won't do much of the density plot, but we do a bunch of plots like this, and we call it trace plot. Anything else? If you want, you can also go up to the middle part of the uh, of the code that is doing the conjugate prior from the last chapter. So the conjugate prior from last chapter, you don't need to do Gibbs sampler because you have the, the um, posterior derived analytically, right? You know that the mean gonna be a normal and the vari uh, the feed, the precision gonna be a gamma. So you see that from line eight to line 26, there's no loop at all. We just do a uh, straightforward multi-color approximation over there. So you might be curious, I mean, this might be a good thing to do after class today would be, oh, I, won't, I wonder, like, now I have two different ways to analyze the data. I have two different ways to set up the prior. Do they give us similar results, et cetera, et cetera? And then if, you, it's hard, if it's hard to verify just looking at the parameters, you might want to do some predictions, right? 
because using the predictions will be a good way to evaluate how at least doing posterior prediction checks can allow you to see if the model is not good. Might not, it won't tell you if it's super good. It can only tell you that it might not be good. So this will be like this set of slide, uh, this set of R code will, uh, will be a good way to, now, same data set, I have two different normal models I'm doing. One is conjugate prior from chapter five. The other one is the semi-conjugate independent priors from chapter six. And then I have two different ways of analyzing it. Which one is better? That will be a natural question to ask, I think. All right, um, okay, so I think, yeah, we're gonna end, but just, just really quick, maybe I will, let's see. I will show you what we are doing next time. So we are better prepared. Really quick. Yeah, so on Moodle, you will see that this are the stuff that I posted. Okay, so the give sampler section. So this is the first set of slides is today's slide, and then the code that we talked about today. So on Wednesday, I think we're gonna start talking about the MCMC diagnostics first. There is a set of R code over there for you to play with, so feel free. The regular discussion board. And then the paper, so I don't, yeah, I guess you've been, yeah, just take some time to start reading it. I, I doubt we're gonna be able to like get into a lot of the details on Wednesday, but uh, the goal is you should read this it's about 10 pages, I think, and then this will be the reading guide that you can refer to with six questions that you can try to answer. And, um, and this is the paper itself. So on Wednesday, we're gonna start the diagnostics and then start talking about, and that finish that, talk about the paper, how to understand it, and then also, I think on Wednesday we're talking, so in the normal model case, let me see. Um, let me see if I can bring that up. Sorry about this really quick. Mm. Yeah, so this, uh, right, so on Wednesday, this is the team assignment, I will send the link again. Uh, but again, so for Wednesday, the discussion will be, first of all, the peak Malian uh, study in the normal lecture slides, and also um, maybe part of the explaining, explaining the gift sample paper discussion, as well as um, the actual code, like the actual diagnostic slides that we're gonna do. So this is the assignment. I think you should, yeah, I mean, this was sent um, the week, yeah, before the October break. So definitely try to understand the, Example yourself first, and then maybe send a quick email to everybody else in the team uh, to make sure that you're doing in the right way. Okay. So, but but again, because we didn't get the chance to talk too much about the diagnostics yet, so on Wednesday we're going to start talking about the diagnostics, the slides, and the le like the lecture slides and the code, and then we're going to bring back the study, like the particular analysis study in team, and then we can start looking at the deep sampler paper. Okay. So yeah. Oh, you don't have to turn in anything for this. Yeah, yeah, you don't have to turn in anything for this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right.